right now. <laughs> I forgot to hit that button. Um, and we're also live on Facebook. We welcome questions at any time. There is a Q&A button for those on Zoom, so go ahead and use that at any time to ask Andy a question. Um, and Andy's going to have some questions throughout his presentation for you guys, so feel free to use that to, to answer his questions. So go ahead, take it away, Andy. Hi, everyone. Um, we'll be talking about uh, projectile points today and uh, some of the myths and cool facts about projectile points. So when I say projectile points, I mean, uh, you know, several different things, spear points, um, arrow points, dart points, uh, all those. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys and uh, you can follow along. I've got a PowerPoint here with uh, all my pictures and stuff in it. So uh, hopefully this will work. Does it appear to be working, Amber? Okay, good. I'll have to pull the question and answer. Will you let me know when uh, there's a question? Because the box kind of overlaps my... Absolutely. Uh, all right, thank you. So uh, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at ISU, and I'm also the curator of anthropology at the Idaho Museum of Natural History, which you're uh, joining with us today. So uh, anytime you have any questions, feel free to post them. I'd be happy to stop and answer your questions along the way. So uh, stone tools, the basics. Um, kind of give you a little bit of introduction to, you know, what are stone tools? How long have they been around for? Um, here on the left, you can see a picture of, uh, this is a, called a cache of stone tools. Uh, this is Clovis age. So these are about 13,000 years old. These were found in somebody's front yard in Colorado, actually. Uh, I think it was back in, uh, in 2004, 2005. But uh, this cache of stone tools is actually a whole bunch of uh, bifaces and flakes that Clovis people left behind in the past uh, so they could come back to it and uh, reuse them and get flakes for them for all kinds of different tasks. And uh, can you see my arrow moving? Uh, this piece right here, this is actually uh, called Tiger Chur. This is actually a type of a oil shale chert. This comes from Wyoming, not too far from uh, where you're at right now if you're in Pocatello, uh, only about 200 miles off to the east. So this, uh, different materials here show that these people have been uh, all over the landscape uh, collecting these different materials. <clears throat> so some of the oldest stone tools that we know of are about 3.3 million years old. And actually, it wasn't even human beings that made these stone tools. Uh, it was a distant human ancestor called, I know it's a mouthful, Australopithecus afarensis. And uh, this was a you know, three and a half, four foot tall hominin, a uh, human-like looking ape, but uh, they did make little stone tools. And uh, these are some of the earliest ones that we've ever found. The earliest stone tools that were actually made by humans that we know of are about 2.6 million years old. And um, those are made by the genus Homo, and we usually associate that with the species called Homo habilis, and that actually means handyman. And uh, we categorize these in a, a period called the Oldowan. You might have heard that term dated about now and then. Um, chip stone tools, which we're focusing on here, not ground stone tools. Chip stone tools are almost always made out of some type of a what we call a cryptocrystalline rock. Uh, rocks like chert, flint, obsidian, jasper. And the term cryptocrystalline simply means that you can't see the grain structure uh, in the rock. Uh, it means it's just very fine. A lot of times it's very glass-like. The making of stone tools itself is a process of reduction, where you're actually removing material. There's no way to add material back to it. So just like a sculptor is working on a statue and taking away bits of rock, to reveal the statue underneath, the same thing applies to stone tools. You're removing things to try and find that arrowhead or spear point hidden in the rock. And stone tools uh, in the past were used for a lot of the same activities that uh, we do today. Um, use them as hammers, chisels, scrapers, knives, spear points, arrow points, uh, drills, uh, burins, uh, all kinds of different activities from working wood to making other stone tools, uh, the processing animals, to hunting animals, 
uh, collecting plants, processing plants, uh, you name it, stone tools have been used to do those different activities. So bear that in mind next time you're picking up a hammer or maybe even a chisel and working some wood or maybe scraping something or using a knife. Um, this is a very long tradition that goes back very, very far in time. So you might be thinking, well, stone tools, are they still around? Well, some people actually still do use stone tools. But just to give you a little bit of perspective, stone tools have been used by humans for 99% of our existence. And I'm not talking about going back 2.6 million years. I'm talking about just going back 200,000 years for fully modern homo sapiens. You know, we know the earliest people look just like us, have the same brain, brain size, same abilities. That's about 200,000 years ago. It's only in the last 10,000 years or so that we've started to use other materials to make tools, like uh, metals, um, you know, using iron and copper and bronze and things like that to do a lot of our work. Well, that's only very, very recently that we've turned to this. And many people have lost the skills of how to make stone tools. It's something that is relatively a lost art. Very few people in the world actually practice making stone tools anymore. Um, and because stone tools have been around for so long, nearly 95% of archeological sites worldwide have stone tools. So it really pays off as an archeologist to know a lot about stone tools. You're likely to find it almost every site that you visit. Uh, very rarely, it might even be a historic site or uh, maybe a medieval site. There might not be any stone tools there, but you start to see them pop back up when people start using uh, rifles and guns. Uh, you know, you've heard of flintlock uh, pistols and flintlock muskets and things like that. It kind of had a resurgence where people had to learn how to make flints for guns although they use metal tools to actually produce those flints. And um, even today, and I mean today, uh, different parts of the world, people still use stone tools in their daily lives. Uh, the woman that you see at the left here, uh, she's a, in Kansu, Ethiopia, and they still use uh, stone tools for scraping down hides and processing hides. And um, they use it for all kinds of different things, for some for clothing, uh, some for uh, shoes, things like that. But they actually prefer using the chipped stone over metal. And if you're interested, I could actually share papers with you on why they still do this. The primary reason is that metal tools tend to cut through some of the very fine hides that they work um, in Ethiopia from some of these small ungulates that they uh, process. Do you have any questions so far? Yes, we do. It's from Xavier, and he wants to know, what was the first stone tools? Sure. Uh, so the first stone tools were very, very simple. Uh, they were mostly just uh, little flakes of stone uh, that were knocked off of a core. Uh, so a core would be um, simply a, a larger rock, and you strike that with another stone, and you're taking a little sharp flake off. You know what? Uh, give me one second. I actually have a cast here that I can pull out and show you. So hopefully this will show up. This is actually a flake uh, from the Oldowan that was uh, knocked off of a core and uh, very simple. So the earliest things were really just sharp little flakes that were taken off and used. I've actually got another one here. So these are plastic. This isn't the real thing, right? These are, these are copies for study for students. Got some other interesting ones here. Um, also in the old one, they made these little pebble tools that are similar to this here. So they would take off the edges of these rocks that were usually cryptocrystal, like tur, flint, and this was used as a little chopper. And for the most part, this was used to disarticulate animals and also to uh, break into the bones uh, to get that marrow, the real rich uh, fatty marrow that was inside of like femurs and things like that. So that's an old one tool right there. Other question? Not right now. Okay. 
we'll, we'll keep going on. I'm glad I had that here. <laughs> so uh, projectile points, the basics. Um, hopefully, I can go on here. It's stuck. There we go. So <clears throat> people often ask, well, what is a projectile point? Um, you know, the, the term that people tend to use is arrowhead. But projectile points are going to be a hafted element, uh, usually to a piece of wood. And that can be hafted to a spear shaft that is going to be either uh, thrown or thrusted at an animal. Um, you see here on the left, this is actually a, a hafted point uh, that's um, probably uh, within 100 miles of this area. These are pretty common. Uh, this was actually used as a lance point. So again, it's like a spear. And then we have darts that are used with an atlatl. You can see uh, three prehistoric examples here. These are called uh, four shafts that have the uh, dart point attached uh, to the four shaft. You can see right here, this point that's still attached. These were found in a dry cave. You can also see a broken point here in this four shaft. So this was actually socketed into a larger section of the dart. And that might be six feet, eight feet long. And that was used with an atlatl. I've got a picture here. These are several atlatls. Um, and the longer spear itself would be socketed into this little area here that has this hook. And this piece is broken here, but also had a hook here. And this is the motion that you would have for throwing that spear with the four shaft attached. So a good way to think about those is kind of like ammunition. It's very cheap to make these uh, four shafts and the projectile points. It's not that hard to do. What's really hard to do is find a six to eight foot long piece of wood that's fairly straight. And if it's not, you keep straightening under a fire, it takes you several hours to do. Whereas these uh, dark points and the four shafts don't take too long to make. And I'll talk about that in a second. Andy? Yeah. We have another question from Xavier and he asks, is there a stone type that makes the arrow or spear travel faster? Uh, no, generally what you're going to have is the weight of the uh, spear. If you have the, uh, the spear is just thrust with the hand, that's one thing. If you're throwing it, um, the heavier it is, the greater impact force it's going to have on the animal. So um, I don't know how many of y'all learned this, but in physics there's a formula that's called force is equal to mass times acceleration. So you kind of have to uh, compromise between the mass of something and the speed at which it's thrown or the acceleration. So with something like an atlatl, you can get a lot of force by extending your arm and having this fulcrum here that'll let you throw this very fast. You cannot throw it as fast with your hand as you could with an atlatl. With an atlatl, you can reach 70, maybe 80 miles an hour if you're a pro. With a spear, if you throw it, you're probably only going to get about maybe 30 to 40 miles per hour. And it has to be heavy enough to kind of have that force balanced where it becomes deadly. And here are some examples of the tips of uh, arrows. Um, some arrows also use the concept of the four shaft, but these have different barbs or what are called microliths. And uh, this one here, this is actually used for hunting birds, these smaller ones that are kind of straightened off. And we'll talk more about that here in a second about the, the idea of bird points. These are kind of some myths that we're going to go over. And again, here you can see a bow, arrow. These are pretty historic examples. This is from the uh, Museum of the North in Fairbanks. Take a picture of that. Um, and also know that not all projectile points in the past were made of stone either. Uh, some were made of shell, some were made of antler, some bone, some were made of wood that you fire hardened over a campfire. And one that a lot of people don't know about is even alligator gar scales. So it's a, a large fish, but the scales from these animals were used frequently uh, down in the southeastern United States where alligator gars were plentiful. So basically they would just take these little scales off the animal and you could go hunt uh, white-tailed deer with that. So let's get to some of the myths uh, about projectile points. The myth is that all triangular stone objects found on archeological sites are arrowheads. That's not true. Um, there are so many objects that are found that are made of stone that are triangular that have totally different functions that are not arrowheads. So <clears throat> a projectile point, it has a pointed end and some kind of worked element which we call the haft. 
And that is what enabled us to put that projectile point onto a piece of wood or maybe even an ivory shaft if you're in Clovis times. Now, I have a question for you, if you guys want to answer this in the Q&A. So in this picture at the left, can you spot the only projectile point in this picture? There's only one out of all these. So take a second, think about it. Y'all ready? Okay, the one projectile point is right there at the upper left. This is the only projectile point in this collection of Clovis stone tools. The other ones, these are cores, these two here. This is a knife. This is a knife, this is a knife, this is a knife. This is another core that is about to become a knife. This is a knife. This is actually a spear point for thrusting. This is like a lance point. And this is what we call a biface or a preform. This is about to become spear point. So for a lot of cultures around the world, these stone tools had a life history where they would start out as basically cores that were moved for flakes and using those flakes to do different cutting tasks. And then as they got smaller and smaller, they would end up turning that into a knife. And then after it reached its end point of being a knife, it would actually become a preform like this, where they would shape it into a spear point. And then after the spear point either broke or got smaller, they would transition into an atlatl dart like this here. So this was actually a dart point that was hafted onto an atlatl. Okay, so myth number two, it takes a really long time to make a spear point or an arrow point. Now, that's a, a little bit of an iffy question, right? Because it does take skill and patience to make certain types of projectile points, like this Clovis point here. That does take quite a while. But to make things like arrow points, you only need a few tiny little flakes like this. And you can process that into these arrow points. And a lot of times you can crank these out if you have the right skill and you have plentiful material. You can do about one every 15 to 20 minutes. Now making a spear point like this takes about an hour, hour and a half. Um, personally, I've been flint napping for about, so flint napping is making stone tools. I've been doing that for about 21 years now. And it takes me about an hour, hour and a half to make a Clovis point like this, provided I don't break it in half right, as I'm working on it. But you know, you start out from a fairly large core like this, and you work that down into a biface, and then that biface gets smaller and smaller until you can make it into this projectile point. Now, if you're doing it like the Clovis people did, you wouldn't go to this point right away, right? You would have the core and taking all the flakes off and then become a biface and a knife, etc. So another question for you all. What is this activity called here at the bottom in this picture? Anybody know? Anybody want to take a guess? I know there's at least one participant that was in my class, so you should know this. Nope, not carving. It's actually called pressure flaking. So pressure flaking is pushing off small, teeny tiny little flakes to make these arrowheads like this. So pressure flaking is one of, you know, three, four different ways to make projectile points. Um, you can use a hard hammer stone like this here. You can use a billet. This is made out of, uh, I believe this one is elk. Um, and then other smaller hammer stones and other little bits of wood that you can use to process and make different stone tools. But this picture here, this is actually a picture of who's called the last Yahi Indian. Uh, his name was Ishi. And uh, Alfred Krober actually um, took care of him in his later years because uh, the government wouldn't help him or provide any assistance. He was the last person of his tribe. And he actually lived at the museum uh, at UCLA for about 15 years for the last part of his life. But he was nice enough to show Alfred Krober and some others exactly how he lived and how he made stone tools. So a lot of what we know is actually 
taken from Ishi and uh, these different videos and pictures that we have of him. Very, very useful information. And actually there's a, a way of doing pressure flaking where you attach this to a long stick and we actually call that an Ishi stick these days in the flint napping community. So myth number three, the hafted tools with the round ends are meant for stunning prey rather than killing it. This is a very common myth uh, that I hear a lot and you hear it in uh, communities where people collect stone tools, they collect arrowheads, and in reality, most of these never were arrowheads. Um, the hafting on these is fairly simple and um, doesn't take a whole lot of uh, effort to make. These were actually scrapers. And the rounded edge is perfect for scraping hides. Uh, in some cases, if you have it at a 90 degree angle uh, with a stick coming off the side like that, it actually makes a really good ads for woodworking as well. So you could use it for woodworking activities, but for the most part, these are used for scraping hides and making clothes and shoes. Um, what is puzzling to some people, and this is where they get confused, is that sometimes projectile points, when they reach the end of their lifespan, they would simply be recycled into a scraper. And that's why people um, in the collecting community think that, oh, well, this is, a, this is something that was used to stun the prey, right? Um, this is a projectile point. This is from the southeast. This is, I believe it's called a thieves point. But this is what the projectile point looks like towards the end of its life. It doesn't have much cutting power left in it. Uh, if it gets resharpened maybe one more time, but after that, if the tip breaks or it has any kind of impact fractures, more than likely people would turn that into a scraper. So these are not used for disabling prey. These are used for scraping hides. Uh, it simply would not work uh, in that effect. In a lot of cases, when you wanted to uh, disable or stun prey, you'd actually use a blunt piece of wood uh, in place of stone or even a, a, just a blunt, um, large round piece of wood that would fit on the end. So question, this is a tricky one, maybe some of y'all know it out there. What's the misleading folk term for hafted scrapers? What got an answer? I see people are raising their hand, Amber, but I don't see, um, the question in the Q&A. It looks like uh, Terry uh, raised his hand. Terry, I, yeah, go ahead, Terry. Yeah, I didn't mean to raise my hand, Andy. I just uh, accidentally, uh, well, oh. sorry about that. No problem. Do you know what the term is? What was the question again? What's the misleading folk term for hafted scrapers? Oh, no, I don't know that. The, the folk term that you hear a lot in the click community is a stunner. They're called stunners. So not like they're stunningly pretty, right? But they're for stunning prey. And that's definitely not the case. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> Oh, and it looks like it activated Siri too on my phone when I said thanks, Terry. <laughs> All right, so on to myth number four. And this is, you hear this all the time uh, among uh, amateur archaeologists and collectors. The smallest arrowheads were used for killing birds. So these are often called bird points. And this is a very large misconception. Um, actually, some of the smallest projectile points found out there were actually very deadly to large game. And uh, this goes back to that whole idea of, you know, force is equal to mass times acceleration. If you can take a tiny little piece of stone and you can accelerate it very quickly, like from a bow, you get a lot of force that can kill an animal. And these arrowheads, even though they're often called bird points, they're actually capable of killing very large animals up to the size of a bison. And if you don't believe me, here's a picture. This is actually the skull of a bison, and this has a, uh, what we call an Ellis point from Texas that's embedded in the skull of this animal. 
So the amount of force to do this is tremendous. Um, you can actually read accounts, what we call ethno-historical documents, of Spanish uh, explorers, in particular Coronado, um, his accounts, his diaries. Uh, there's a book called The Journey of Coronado, and they talk about witnessing Native Americans. This is before they were on horseback, um, stalking bison, and then actually shooting an arrow all the way through the animal, going from one side of a bison out through the other side and coming out. So we have documentation of their bows being very powerful and these tiny little projectile points actually doing this. And when we actually have the reintroduction of the horse in the 16th century, and it spreads among lots of different Native Americans, in particular the uh, Plains Native Americans, they were highly effective at killing buffalo slash bison. Um, they could ride up alongside a bison. Uh, you know, you're at high speed, you get the whole herd moving. And a really effective shot is actually to shoot down and at an angle through the bison. The way that the bison's anatomy is, you can actually get a double lung shot through that animal at that particular angle. So when you're on a horseback, you're at the ideal angle to shoot that projectile point down through the animal. And we're talking tiny, tiny little projectile points, right? Little what they call bird points. Uh, if you use one of those on a bird, it'd probably explode. It cut up all the meat and wouldn't be worth anything. So here's a close point of that Ellis uh, in this. You can actually see this if you're ever down in Houston. In Houston, Texas, they have this on display. So I uh, have a question from Victoria. Uh, in your opinion, is it more advantageous or convenient to use stone tools as opposed to metal tools? Um, so I get asked this a lot, uh, particularly in questions to the apocalypse, right? If it's the end of the world, are you going to go out in the woods and survive on stone tools? No, there's going to be so much metal that's left over. I'm going to probably make a metal knife if I don't have one or if I haven't stolen one from a, a sporting goods store or something like that, right? Uh, you know, you get answered that all the time. Um, I will say that in some cases, stone tools are more effective at cutting than metal tools are. Um, a lot of times, uh, if I have the opportunity in my classes, I show students the difference between cutting with a piece of obsidian versus a steel scalpel. You can actually, um, and a guy named Don Crabtree, uh, in the past actually showed how effective the cutting edge of obsidian is compared to stone or to a, a surgeon's scalpel. And it's about three to four times sharper a piece of obsidian that's freshly flaked versus a surgeon's scalpel. And there's a couple of papers in different medical journals that show that when you take a piece of obsidian that's freshly flaked and you cut the skin, instead of tearing at the cellular structure, it actually bisects the cells cleanly. So when that wound comes back together and you have to get it stitched up, the cells actually come back into place and align where they were. So things can heal three to five times faster, a cut from obsidian versus a cut from a piece of metal. So there are some uh, advantages to that. And you know, like with the uh, Konsu woman there in Ethiopia, they prefer using stone because it doesn't cut through the hide like metal tools do got to be a lot uh, less careful and you can apply more force. So yes, there are some cases where um, it's more advantageous. Good question. Great question. So now I'm going to go on to uh, some interesting facts that uh, some of y'all might not know. Uh, cool fact number one, um, we can actually tell by the shape and size of most projectile points where they come from geographically and the time period. Um, this is a sequence of different projectile points from the Great Basin. And if you see here, we're going back to about 10,000 years ago. Um, here's a Clovis point. Uh, actually, it should be a lot lower here. Uh, this is 9,000, 10,000. Should be a little bit closer here, but this is a Clovis point, Folsom point. Uh, we have some Angostura, Haskett. And then we go all the way up here into some of these, uh, well, there's Rosegate and a couple others up in this direction. But here we see these arrowheads. And at a site, if we're finding one of these projectile points at a certain layer, we know that we're somewhere in the sequence in time. So we don't even have to have a radiocarbon date to figure out what the age of that uh, site is. And provided it's undisturbed, if you had maybe a, you're in a cave that's 20 feet deep and full of soil, um, you could maybe work your way back in time 
from these arrowheads all the way back down to Clovis. But by the shape and size of these different uh, projectile points, it tells us when they were made, and in a lot of cases, what part of the state or the region they came from. And <clears throat> another question that I get asked a lot of times is, well, what was the name of these people? How do you know their name was Clovis? Or how do you know their name was Haskett or Cougar Mountain or whatever? Those are names that we've assigned to them because we don't know what their names were in the past. These people didn't have a writing system. You know, writing systems don't come around. Some of the earliest, I think, in China is, you know, five, 6,000 years ago with very simple symbols. And, you know, you get in Mesopotamia and different writing systems and cuneiform and things like that. But that's very late. These things go back to 10,000 years. So we have no way of knowing what they call themselves. And this is an example of uh, some projectile points from uh, the southeastern United, or no, this is from a, kind of the uh, Midwest into the Southeast a little bit. There's Sewanee Simpson here. But these different projectile points have names, right? So if you're looking at these names, a lot of times these are based on the area that they came from. So a lot of times, like with Folsom, the very first point that looked like this was found in Folsom, New Mexico. But we find Folsom points all over the West of the United States. Clovis points, we find these all across North America parts of South America, up into Canada and Alaska. Um, but these points are named after Clovis, New Mexico. All right, it's not the term Clovis is those people. It's the name of the location where it was found. And the same goes for Page, uh, Page Ladson, the Sewanee Simpson, uh, different parts of Georgia and Florida have those, Dalton. These, you see, they're named side knots due to the morphology of them. But you can see we can go back in time from 11,700 uh, to 13,250. And you can see the variation there just through that short two to 3,000 year period. So fact number two, and you know, this goes to a lot of people, uh, they often ask, well, if I find a, a projectile point when I'm walking around or hiking, what should I do with it? Well, a lot of times I tell them it's best just leave it where it is. And it's really bad if you're going to go out there and start digging up all around where you found it. Uh, and the reason is a lot of people don't know that we can learn so much from a single projectile point. And a perfect example of that is here with cool fact number two. We can actually use a microscope to investigate all these tiny little scratches and marks that are on the surface of stone tools. And this will tell us what kind of activities they were used for. Um, this is actually pictures of obsidian, and this is the edge of a stone tool. And I believe it's actually the edge of a projectile point that was used uh, for different activities other than simply hunting, right? A lot of times people would, after you shoot an animal and you pull your projectile point out, it sure does make a handy knife, right, with that little foreshaft. It's just like a little knife that you can cut that animal up with. So you can see here some of these striations are actually from cutting uh, against some of the hide and might even get in there with some of the bone with these little chips here on the edges. Uh, I'm not an expert at this uh, by any means, but people have done many uh, different experimental archaeology projects figuring out what does cutting up, a, a, let's just say, cattails. If you're cutting up cattails, what does the striations look like? If you're cutting a piece of elk meat versus a rabbit, what does the striation look like? Um, there's been many different activities. If you're cutting wood with a projectile point, what does that look like? I've made lots of projectile points for people to do these projects, but I'm not the one that looks through the microscope and analyzes it and all that stuff. But you can definitely see there is some utility there. So that's just one thing that we can do. Now, if you took this home and you scrubbed the edge, uh, or maybe even you used it for something yourself just to see what it would do, you would obliterate all these scratches. It doesn't take a whole lot to get rid of those scratches. A lot of times you'll see multiple activities that overlap as well on these edges. Another cool thing that we can do is chemical analysis to look at the residue on stone tools. And, you know, people in the past, they use them to cut up animals, use it for cutting plants. Uh, all these tools here, these were all used in an experiment uh, with different types of flakes and bifaces to figure out, well, can we look at the residue here? 
Now, if you ever look, let me go forward here to another, let me go back and find a better stone tool. So if you look here, let's just take this one, the Sewanee, uh, or not, this isn't Sewanee, something, these are here, or Quad Lake. Um, if you see all these ridges and these little angles, all these little angles can trap little bits of residue and tissue, and blood can actually get stuck in there, and yes, it will start decomposing, but we can It appears Andy has muted. Can Hopefully. actually pull it. Andy, you're kind My of. Uh, Andy. Yeah. You kind of uh, cut out there for a second. Okay. Uh, did I? Did y'all hear about the blood residue? You were just about to tell us. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so let me go back a little bit. Let me think here. Uh, train of thought. You got uh, to where uh, it decomposes. Ah. So I guess it was probably from flicking back in the PowerPoint too fast. Um, and all these little edges of these stone tools are like little traps. And these can hold blood and fat and uh, what we call lipids, so different oils uh, from plants, and uh, natural oils and resins can get trapped in here. So we can tell things like what kind of animals were processed. We can uh, figure out, well, was this a uh, deer-like animal, or even was this an elephant-like animal, maybe a, a mammoth. Um, you know, people use stone tools to cut them up just like every other animal. So we can figure out what kind of activities they were used for. And on top of, you know, cutting up the, the animals, we also have a thing called phytoliths. And phytoliths are little silica structures that are in plants. And the phytoliths kind of give rigidity to a lot of plants. If some plants didn't have these little silica structures in them, they actually would just fall flat on the ground. So these little silica structures are very unique to different plants. And you can see here down on the left, these are all little tiny phytoliths from many different kinds of plants. And they're all very, very unique. And because they're so unique and we can tell what kind of plant uh, they're made out of, those get stuck as well in these cracks and crevices. So if you're out there and you find a projectile point or you find a stone tool, you take it home and you scrub it up and you get all the dirt off of it, you just washed away all that information that we could have figured out about it. We could have figured out what animal they killed, what animal they processed, they cut up some plants with it. There's a ton of information that can be found there. And another important aspect to these uh, cut marks and these uh, striations and residue is that when we study bones, we're making a connection here between the process of the stone tool and then all the different cut marks on animals themselves that we might find. So if you find stone tools and you take them home and then archeologist comes back later and they just find the bones you left behind, we're missing that connection, right? We're missing that stone tool that was actually cutting up these bones and creating these cut marks on it. So if we can make that connection at a site, that really tells us a lot about what was going on at a site, what kind of activity was happening. So the next fact, and this is gonna be the, uh, one of the last ones, um, while it's really um, awesome to find whole complete projectile points, we learn a lot more about past human behavior from the broken ones. And you know, when you find that, that complete projectile point at a site, you're like, oh my God, look how cool this is. But for me, a person that's in a stone tool analysis and the flint napping, when I find uh, maybe one that was broken during production or one that's left behind at a site that has a tip break, like this Pertinalis point is late archaic point from Texas. Here's another Pertinalis point with an impact fracture. It can tell us a lot about what was going on in the past. The coolest part is like, this is just screaming at us, hey, look what happened to us in the past. Here's this snapshot in time of this activity that we were carrying out, right? And actually for my uh, PhD dissertation, it told me a lot about when I was looking at the different sources of where these projectile points came from, I did a chemical analysis on these rocks and studying geographically where the rock came from. And because some of these were just very lightly broken, I asked the question, 
okay, why did they throw this away? It just has a tip fracture. Why did they throw this one away? Or why did the other ones get so small and why are they so crappy? Why did they not do that to this? Well, these projectile points came from a long ways off, meaning they probably traveled with it and they had to resharpen it and reuse it until it got very small. But when they got to a site that had fresh rock, they could afford just to make a new one after a tip break, right? They didn't want to go through the process of chipping it down and maybe making it smaller. But what's interesting is the ones that have very small defects at the site that are made of local material, a lot of times they just get discarded. The ones that are from sources far away at a site, this is from the Gulf site in Texas, they're often very crappy and, and very crudely resharpened down to nothing because of this kind of the source uh, location versus need and necessity. Just like today, you know, uh, ah, good example, uh, toilet paper, right? You think there's not gonna be any toilet paper left, you start conserving it, right? All of a sudden it's like, oh, we're not gonna have this, or what are those, uh, Clorox wipes? Like everybody wants to get those, right? Now you might use one on your whole counter as opposed to just a little area, right? So same thing in the past. Good COVID uh, connection. Um, and the reason that we know what type of activity was occurring, like how do I know this tip fracture is from an impact or this is from an impact and not from a draw? Well, archeologists that came before me and I'm actually doing stuff like this today with other materials, we know what it looks like when it was broken during production. Uh, maybe somebody dropped it and it hit a rock. Uh, they shot at a deer and it hit a piece of wood or maybe it even impacted bone of an animal. Uh, or it just chipped off the ground, uh, or even if it was intentionally snapped. There's been lots of studies where people just, uh, they step on them or they snap them with their hands. And uh, that looks a very specific way as opposed to something, uh, if it was uh, impacting an animal and, and having a little tip break here. Um, another question that I get with these guys is, um, you know, why were these thrown away and not just re -chipped? The same goes, as I said before, with the Clovis points in this picture here. Uh, here's some small arrow points. This is actually from a site in Portugal called the Gruta de Morgado. The uh, majority of these ones that are discarded here just have little tip fractures. And they would just discard them and make a new one. A lot of times they probably did it because it was just covered in blood and stuff like that. They didn't feel like cleaning it up maybe. Um, there's been different um, reasons why they say that these were discarded. But for the most part, we know these are little tip fractures, probably from impacts in the animal. Um, you know, this is what, if you're out there and you're uh, excavating a site with me somewhere and you're screening it, you might have something like that pop up. Well, that's an impact fracture. They created this kind of a catastrophic failure here along the edge. These are examples of uh, some older points. These are uh, Folsom and Clovis points. Uh, these are, uh, I think this is a San, maybe it's a San Patrice, I can't remember. I think this is an Ellis. This is from one site though, but you can see these are catastrophic failures with this uh, Folsom point. And what's interesting about this one is that this probably broke right where the haft was. With Folsom points, a lot of times they were fluted all the way up, they had this channel flake. But if you drew an outline on this guy, that tip would break probably where the haft ended. So it's a very telltale sign when it snaps like that, what that would look like. And the same goes for this uh, Clovis point. This flute ends about right here. So to have it snap at that area is probably where the haft was, more than likely. And here's a good impact fracture here from the side like that. So it hit it in a bleak angle. More questions? Yeah, Andy, we have a question, another question from Xavier. Um, he wants to know, have you ever found any points? I have. I found uh, dozens of points uh, when I worked at the Galt site. And then, um, you know, you just walk around the Galt site and you find them. But I found them in excavations before. A lot of times we find just um, small uh, broken pieces. And what's fun to me about that, it's like a puzzle a lot of times. That if you can find something like just the edge of this uh, basally notched area of a Pertinalis point, and you know right away, hey, that's a Pertinalis point. It, it feels really good to when you become so familiar with these things that you can tell just from little bits and pieces what they are. 
Um, so yeah, I found dozens of points. I haven't kept, kept track over the years, uh, but from working and excavating at the Gulf side, and then before that, I worked at a job called Culture Resource Management, and I found lots of projectile points uh, on surveying uh, doing that, and that's always fun too. You know, you're, you're just walking out in the field and you're finding artifacts. It's super cool. Um, so let's move on here um, to the last one. And this is Guess the Cool Facts. So I'm going to give you a little bit of time to figure this one out. And maybe y'all can all answer in the uh, Q&A section. So I'm going to show you two dart points. And they're made from the exact same material. But why is the dart point on the right here, why is it such a different color? So I'm going to give you a couple of different options. Is it A, patina, or what we call it, like the shine and the gloss from being in ground uh, for a long time near water? Is it B, it's been painted with ochre, a red mineral? C, has it been heat treated in a campfire? Or D, is it natural variation in the stone color? And I'll tell you right now, these are about, I think these are 120,000 year old projectile points from Blombos Cave in South Africa. So maybe y'all can all chime in the Q&A and answer. Maybe I'm while we're waiting for everyone to uh, chime in what their answer would be, um, you could answer Terry's question. Is there an active fillet napping community in Pocatello? Yes, and there's one person in it, me. <laughs> uh, I've been trying to get a flint napping group together at the school. Uh, and that was actually going to happen this summer. Uh, with the flint napping field school but um of course because of the uh, pandemic and everything we couldn't carry out the field school so maybe next year we can start it up and you know i had a lot of interested students so maybe we could start another active flint napping community it'd be really fun i wish there was so it wasn't just a group of one <laughs> your your meeting times are easy aren't they yeah <laughs> yeah um, so far, Virginia has said D, and Terry has said the red ochre. Anybody else? Too scared to answer? Okay, well, the correct answer is actually C, heat treated in a campfire. And heat treatment, this is one of the earliest examples of heat treatment that we know of. This material is actually called silkrete. And uh, the authors of this paper actually reached out to me and asked me some questions about heat treatment because I did my master's thesis on heat treatment and they mainly wanted to know, well, what happens when you heat treat different kinds of rocks? How does it improve? Because I took um, a material called Edwards Chert from the Edwards Plateau in Texas and I did some different heating experiments to see if it improved the workability of the material and the way I did this was using different engineering principles and looking at the hardness and the toughness of the material. So what's interesting with this piece though if you look at it carefully you can see that it discolored it from the heat but they probably heated this material for too long on the campfire and it became actually harder because it went beyond a certain limit. You see how crappy it looks right here on the edge? All these bad flakes they kind of terminate in an ugly fashion and they're not smooth like this edge. So this actually probably went too long. Although it made a color, uh, very pretty colorful rock, ideally it should have looked like this. This one was also slightly heat treated and you can see some of the coloration there as well. But they see this evidence very early on in Blombos Cave in Africa. And I have that paper too if anyone's interested in reading it. But um, like I said, you can see the difficulty that they had there. And at the bottom, we've got two modern uh, recreations of dark points. And uh, these are both actually made of the same material as well. And the one on the right has been heat treated, the one on the left hasn't. And you can see how it changes color. And I think that happens because of uh, iron oxide uh, kind of reacts with the water in the material and it draws it to the surface. That's still something that needs to be investigated more fully. Maybe I'll do that in the future when I'm not busy with a million other things. But uh, yeah, so that's heat treating. And 
Um, an interesting side note here, something a lot of people don't know, is some folks think that stone tools were made by dripping water on hot rocks, where you would take a little reed with a, a drip of water, and you would get these rocks really hot, and then you would drip bits of water, and the water would cause it to explode or knock flakes off. Um, a guy named uh, Ellis back in the uh, 40s uh, saw that account in some old papers, uh, ethnohistorical documents, I think from the late 1800s, where they said they observed it happening, but more than likely it was just a lie. Because if you do that, if you heat up this rock to where it gets so hot, more than likely it'll just explode if it's exposed to air and the fluctuations in the rock. But they said they had different sized reeds for making bigger or smaller flakes. So that's also a common misconception that you, know, you still hear that folklore around every now and then. So, you know, this case, this heat treatment might have also been a little bit too long. Either that or the flint napper didn't have a uh, high skill, but I think they did from the way that this looks. So likely the rock just got a little bit too hot again, because you can see these little step, we call step fractures all along the edges. And even the bottom here, you know, it ends in these really sharp edges. So conclusions, um, you know, as we study different stone tools and projectile points, you know, we can learn a lot about the past and human behavior. And this is kind of where, you know, I do that public service message that we can learn so much from these that it's better just to leave them where they're at. Uh, and let an archeologist know, call the museum, tell us, hey, you found one here and, you know, map it on your phone, take a few pictures of it. And if you leave it there, we can go back and we can learn so much more from it as opposed to taking it and putting it in a box somewhere or even putting it on your wall. Um, also, when you remove it from the site, it becomes totally disconnected from all the other artifacts. You know, like I mentioned before with the bone and the cut marks, um, if you take that away, that might have been the exact same tool that was used to cut those bones up. And we can see, you know, use wear things like that on it. And, you know, when you take projectile points from sites and you clean them, like I said, that removes all that residue and you lose all that information and it really becomes nothing more than a piece of art then. It's, it's like a painting on a wall. You know, you, you can't talk to the artist. You know, when you remove the residue from stone tools, it's like you, ha you had an opportunity to talk to the artist or the user, but now that's lost. You know, you've cut, you've cut it off from the past. And uh, we can learn some really, really interesting stories from that. Um, in particular, this is a, called the Hog Eye Cache. Uh, this is a collection of uh, uh, 50 plus uh, stone tools that are all Clovis age. It came from Bastrop, Texas. And these show, when I was talking earlier about that continuum or that process of reduction, you know, some of these are knives, some of these are cores. Um, you know, they were all in that stage of becoming a Clovis projectile point. So not every pointy thing you find at a site is, is an arrowhead, right? So uh, any questions? Yeah, um, we should give a shout out to Richie on Facebook. He got the the question right on the heat treatment. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, we do have a question. Um, Xavier wants to know, what is the best point? Oh, well, that's that's personal <laughs> preference. <laughs> is that like uh, picking your favorite child? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the best point, um, you know, that's uh, up to the person, individual. Um, you know, people that make projectile points today that are modern flint nappers, um, we tend to like the ones that are the most challenging. Um, so, you know, someone would say, oh, the Clovis point's the greatest point ever because you can kill a mammoth. Well, you know, a tiny little, what we call bird points, remember, those tiny little points can kill a bison. So, you know, it's up to you. It doesn't take much to make a little arrowhead. It takes a lot to make a spear point, a lot of skill. But again, that's personal preference. What's your, love, what's your favorite one to make? I love making Clovis points. Um, but what I've been trying to do for years, I know it's gonna sound crazy, is trying to make uh, level wall flakes and uh, what we call preferential low wall flakes that are Neanderthal tools. Mm. They're one of the hardest ones to get right. And you'd think, well, you know, these things go back 200,000, 300,000 years. 
and they're made by Neanderthals, you know, you think they'd be the easiest ones to make. They're one of the hardest ones to get right. And it uses so much material. So I'd say Clovis is definitely one of my most favorite ones to make. And then Folsom are very hard to make, but the most difficult in my opinion are preferential level wall flakes. But just to make the pretty like tortoise back one. Actually, I can show you that real quick. Yeah. Let me see if I can exit out here for a second. Let me actually show you first. Um, hopefully this will work. I'm gonna show you one of the Folsom points that I have in 3D. Okay, can you see this, Amber? Yep. So this is a Folsom preform, right? And just to show you how difficult it is to make this, um, you have to start with a piece of rock that's about three or four times larger than this and about twice as uh, thick before you can get to this stage. So you have to plan way ahead for this to look quite uh, the way it does. But when you're making it, you're trying to get this topography where it's slightly curved on both sides. I don't know if you can see that. And then you also have to make this little thing called a nipple here. This is the striking platform to remove that channel flake down the middle. So you strike here and you're trying to remove a flake that goes all the way down to the end. That's why the Folsom point is one of the most difficult ones to make. Because first you have to chip all these little flakes off and it makes that, that kind of that curvature. If you don't have that curvature, it'll stop short. So you're not making a true Folsom point if you don't do that. So you do this one side first and then afterward you flip it over. You see how this is just rough side? and it's kind of randomly flaked to get thin. Then you got to do this side the same way as this side. And then you got to make another nipple and you got to remove another channel flake. So there's like 15 chances here to break this thing in half uh, the whole way through. So that's kind of a hard thing to do. That's with the Folsom point. And then uh, let me just Google real quick. Can you still see my screen? No. You'll have to share the, your Google search. Okay. I thought I had a uh, preferential of AWA, but here's a good picture. Let me share that now. I can. Can you see this? Yep. So this is a preferential of AWA. This is the flake that you're trying to get. This thing, and we call it a tortoise shell uh, biface sometimes too. It's about as thick as your hand is. Uh, just one second. Well, sorry, I thought I had one, but you know, starting with a rock about this big, I actually have a cast of a big, a preferential little wall that's my office. Um, starting with a piece this big, and then you gotta start making the topography just right on both sides. Mm -hmm. And it's totally counterintuitive to the way that you usually flint nap, and that where you strike is actually um, on the edge where several things intersect. So instead of striking a platform that's following um, a ridge, 
you're actually striking on the opposite side of it. So I know this looks very simple, <laughs> but it is very, very hard to get it just right and to remove this big, beautiful flake. But Neanderthals use this flake as a multi-tool. So they use this both for, for chopping and um, disarticulating animals and for cutting, uh, all kinds of different activities, working wood down. We know they did all that stuff with just this one flake. So that's a hard one to do. And then also the level wall point is very difficult to do as well. So, yep. Any other questions? No, it doesn't look like it. And we are over time. Okay. Yeah, that was Great. fun, Andy. Great, thanks. Hope y'all learned something. Yeah, that was really fun. Um, just, just so everyone knows, next week we will be having Dr. Leif Tapanella. He will be talking about shark infested waters in Pocatello, or as everyone knows, our favorite shark, the buzzsaw. Um, so join us next week. The uh, link is on our webpage right now. So thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, thank y'all.